And somebody said, Good evening, everyone. I said, Good evening. God bless you. God bless me too. And the Lord prosper the word in every life in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the leadership development tonight. Thank you for your people. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for the work you put in our hands. And thank you, Lord, because you have raised us up to do something definite and to achieve a definite goal. We're asking, O oh Lord, your purpose of raising us up will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. No one will fail. No one will compromise. No one will look back. But your power will keep us standing and keep us faithful all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. Grant us your spirit, the revelation of your spirit, the inspiration of your spirit, and the influence of your spirit, so that any time we are tempted to go astray, or to do what we shouldn't do, your spirit will alert us. And then as we are church, we'll go in the right direction in Jesus' name. Bless your people tonight. And use us as a channel of blessing unto the people you have appointed us to lead. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God bless you. We're coming to Second Chronicles. Chapter 25, 2 Chronicles, chapter 25, and I'm reading from verse 1. Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But not with a perfect heart. If you look at that verse 2, it will show you the expectation of the Lord. It will show you the requirement of the Lord. It will show you what the Lord demands from you and demands from me, that it is not just to do the right thing, but he wants us to do that right thing with a perfect heart. He demands perfection. As he called Abraham, he told Abraham, Walk before me and be thou perfect. And then as we look at the children of Israel, John chapter 18, he said he wanted them to also live in that perfection. And as we go through the Old Testament, that's the same thing you'll find. David talking to his own son, Solomon, he says, have a perfect heart in the presence of the Lord. You come to the Psalms, he's saying the same thing that he wants perfection, and he that has a perfect heart shall serve me. You come to the New Testament, the same thing, be therefore perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And then you come to the epistles, and he's still saying the same thing, he wants perfection from us. And if he wants it, and if he demands it, and if he desires it, and if he says that this is what he wants, the grace of God must be available for you and for me. It will be done in Jesus' name. But if you don't aim at it, you will not get it. If you don't understand that this is what God is asking, that he wants you, yes, he wants you to do the right thing, and yet he wants it done with a perfect heart. And what a commentary on the life, on the ministry, on the duty, the responsibility, and the attitude of our Messiah. That he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. The Lord evaluates us with the heart in which we bring to the word of God and to the work of God. And the Lord evaluates our service. He evaluates everything we do according to the attitude, according to the disposition, and according to the state of our heart when we render that service. Now we come to verse 5. It says, Moreover, Amasai gathered Judah together, and he made them captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, 
according to the houses of their fathers throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go to war that could handle spear and shield. There was a battle, a battle raging. And as the king, he knew that he must raise up an army and that army will go with him to the battle. And then he meticulously looked at everything and he got 300,000 soldiers. And then we're told in verse 6, he hired also a 100,000 mighty men of valor out of Israel for 100 talents of silver. He wasn't going to leave anything to chances. He wasn't going to leave anything to maybe we can win with these people or maybe we will be able to have the victory. He wanted to make sure the victory was definite. Because of that, he looked at the other side, the children of Israel. He was king of Judah. And the children of Israel, you understand, Judah and Israel actually they're together until they separated to become the northern kingdom. And he felt, I can get some soldiers from there and they can be of help to me and then we go to the battle and we will win the victory. Look at verse 7. And there came a man of God to him saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee. For the Lord is not with Israel to wait with all the children of Ephraim. What boldness that man of God had, and what courage that man of God had, that he could come to Amaziah and tell Amaziah, all these 100,000 soldiers, the Lord is not with them. What if they overhear that you are the one that came to inform Amaziah that the Lord is not with them. You reported on them. And now Amaziah is going to take an action and they're going to find out sure what the one that let out the secret that the Lord was not with them. You see, that's why some people don't deliver the message God has given them to deliver. What if they hear? What if they know? That I was the one that was the source of information that made this to happen and that to happen. But the man of God was bold like you are going to be bold. Courageous like you are going to be courageous. Faithful like you are going to be faithful. I can't hear the amen I was waiting for. And look at verse 8. It says, but if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall. This man is bold. He's talking to a king. He's talking to a Messiah. He said, I've delivered the message of God to you. And you cannot be neutral. You either do it or you don't do it. And he said, if you don't do it, God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God has power to help and to cast down. I pray you'll be that bold. I pray you'll be that courageous that you'll not be looking at their faces. What if they do this? What if they do that? It is the what if that makes us unfaithful. I will be faithful. Look at verse 9. And Amazar said to the man of God, What shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Then Amaziah separated them to wit the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. Wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home, tell me, in great anger. You know, sometimes doing the will of God may attract the anger of the people who are not totally submissive to the will of God. But thank God you'll be submissive to the will of God. 
Uh, look at uh, the word of God here now in Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with some believers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In verse 17, wherefore come out from among them. The Lord is very clear. It's been very clear in the Old Testament. It's also very clear in the New Testament that believers, followers of the Lord, and children of God must not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers in anything, in marriage, in business, in fellowship, in friendship, in worship, in anything at all. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And it says, wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says, who is talking to us? The Lord Almighty. Tonight, we are looking at the message, the great cost and comprehension of unequal yoke. The great cost and comprehension of the unequal yoke. From that word comprehension, you need to know that we need to properly understand what's the unequal yoke. How does unequal yoke apply to you, to me, or to any child of God? And as we counsel people, as we talk to people, how do we explain the unequal yoke? Because you see, there are people that can go to this extreme and everything to them is the unequal yoke. There are other people that go to the other extreme and there's nothing about the unequal yoke. You must stay in the middle and understand and have the comprehension of what the unequal yoke is. I'm coming to Proverbs chapter 19 and I'm reading from verse 2. Proverbs chapter 19 and we're looking at verse 2. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2, it says also that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. That your soul be without knowledge, that the church be without knowledge, that any child of God be without knowledge, that our converts be without knowledge, that the workers be without knowledge, it is not good. And he that hasteth with his feet sinneth. You cannot just haste into an action while you are ignorant of what the Lord is saying. Isaiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 13. Isaiah chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 13. It says, therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. There must be comprehension of what the Lord is saying. There must be comprehension of what the Lord is telling us when it says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. We're coming to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. He wants us to have the proper understanding and the proper knowledge of what is an equal yoke or any other part of scripture so that we can divide the scripture aright. I'm looking at Hosea chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou was rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me. You see, when we do not have knowledge, the knowledge of the word of God, the knowledge of the doctrines of the Bible, we disqualify ourselves from being ministers 
of God. We cannot just go before the congregation of the Lord and before the people of God and just say something that I think this is what God means. I feel this is what God means. I think this is what the church has been saying. And I repeat the same thing whether I understand or not. I must understand. I must comprehend. I must believe. And I must do it. I must practice it so that that word of God will become very clear Number one, by exhortation. Number two, by example. I preach it so the people can tell this is what we are preaching. I practice it and the people can tell this is what we are practicing. Look at that again. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. I pray God will give us understanding. God will give me understanding. Second Timothy chapter 2. In Second Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7. Second Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at verse 7. Consider what I say. Here is the apostle saying, uh, I'm telling you all this, I'm showing you all this, I'm revealing all this, I'm a kind of uh, making all this available for you by the Spirit of God. And he says, this is the word, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. The Lord will give you understanding. I said the Lord will give you understanding. Tonight, as I said, we're looking at the message, the great cost and comprehension of unequal yoke. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the irretrievable loss of partnership with the ungodly. The irretrievable loss, the loss that is irreparable. The damage that is irreparable. Something that is done, something that comes up as a result of that unequal yoke, irretrievable loss of partnership with the ungodly. I'm coming back to uh, this uh, Second Chronicles chapter 25. Second Chronicles chapter 25. Um, and here we're looking at it from verse 5. The irretrievable loss of partnership with the ungodly. It says, moreover, in verse 5, Amaziah gathered Judah together, and he made them captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, according to the houses of their fathers, throughout all Judah and Benjamin, and he numbered them from 20 years old and above, and he found them 300 thousand choice men able to go forth to war that could handle the spear and shield and he hired here's an equal yoke he didn't know he appeared innocent he appeared ignorant and yet ignorance is no excuse but thank god a man of god came to him to tell him and to show him and to reveal to him that these people, that God was not with them. And so that became an unequal yoke. Even though you wanted victory, but you should get your victory and get your success and get your progress and get your fruitfulness without the unequal yoke. We can't say that I want, you know, the glory of God and then we hinder ourselves in a fellowship with the Lord because we're not following truly the word of God or fully the word of God. Look at verse 6. He hired also 100,000 mighty men of valor out of Israel for a hundred talents of silver. But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel to wait with all the children of Ephraim. But if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God has power to help and to cast down. Then in verse 9, here is the irretrievable loss. He had paid some money, a large sum of money. 
And if he sent away the people, there's no way of getting the money back. And the prophet did not prophet promise him that he'll get the money back. And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do? For the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel. And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee more than this. You'll not get that money back. you lose that money. We shall have sought for counseling. Before you went into that deal, and before you went into that agreement, verse 10, then Amaziah separated them to which the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again, wherefore their anger was, tell me somebody there, greatly kindled. Look up here for a minute. You know, there are people, they know the will of God. They want to do the will of God. Their problem is, if I do the will of God, somebody will get angry. Somebody near me. Somebody in front of me. Somebody that can do something painful to me. He will get angry. They forget God you will get angry. If you don't do the will of God, you have a choice. The choice is the choice between the anger of God or the anger of man. Which one is more serious? Which one is more painful? Which one is eternal? The anger of God. And so Amasa realized that if I do not obey the Lord, already the prophet told me that God will make me fall if I do not obey him, he will be angry at me. Yes, all these Israelites uh, that have chosen from Ephraim, they're angry. They're angry. But there's a greater anger that you need to avoid. And so they returned home in great anger. Come to verse 13. But the soldiers of the army, which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah. That's the cost. That's the cost. That's the consequence. Even though he didn't go with them, even though he eventually obeyed the Lord, even though he canceled that unequal yoke, partnership with the ungodly, yet he suffered for that because now the cities of Judah were under the attack of those soldiers from Samaria, even unto Beth Horon. That is, they just went and they ravaged everywhere from city to city. And they smote how many people? 3,000 of them and took much spoil. That's the cost. That's the cost irretrievable loss 3,000 people died as a result of that look before you leave think before you arch go through in your mind I'm thinking of this I'm thinking of this if I do this what does that mean is that going to translate to unequal yoke? If that is going to translate to unequal yoke, then I withdraw before the consequences will come. There's unequal yoke in marriage, and the Lord told the children of Israel that they must not do. Deuteronomy chapter 7, I'm reading here from verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee to the land whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Gagashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Look at this. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant, no fellowship, no agreement, no league, no communion, no agreement with them, nor show mercy unto them. Verse 3, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter, thou shalt not 
give unto his son. It's telling us to appear that you will not give your daughter to a son of another family that's an unbeliever. It doesn't matter whether their parents are in the church or not. It's uh, the man that you are giving your daughter to, if that man is an unbeliever, if that man is unfaithful, if that man is not obedient to the word of God, you're not saying the parents are in the church. And so what? Is it, your daughter is not marrying the, the parents. Your daughter is marrying the son. And it says, you will not give unto him your daughter, nor his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. My daughter is firm. My daughter is adamant. My daughter is saying that that's the person I'm going to marry. Well, you're not going to give consent to that. You're not going to give agreement to that. The children of nowadays, what if they go out and they go and do it without your consent? That's their decision. But on your own part, you will be uncompromising because you are not going to, uh, you are not going to disobey the Lord in the area of this unequal yoke in marriage. Look at verse 4. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against who? I said against who? I can't hear you. Against you. And it says, and destroyed thee suddenly. I pray you'll not do that. I said, I pray you'll not do that. We're coming to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 18. In Second Chronicles chapter 18, unequal yoke in pursuing victory, conquering an enemy nation. It says in Second Chronicles chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 3. And here the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people. And we will be with thee in the war. Jehoshaphat was a good king, the king of Judah at this time. And Ahab was uh, a bad, sinful, evil, cruel, wicked king. And now Ahab said, that's the um, unbelieving man. That's the cruel man. That's the sinful man. That's the man that didn't know God. A worshiper of Baal said, will you go with me to battle? Will you go with me to remote Gilead? And Jehoshaphat, a good king. Jehoshaphat, a righteous king, he said, of course I will. I am as thou art. Jehoshaphat, that's not true. That's not true. A born again child of God is not as the unbeliever. A real follower of Jesus is not as the person that is following Baal, following the devil. A person that's obedient to the word of God is not like the one that is rebellious and disobedient to the word of God. He said, I am as thou art. My people are thy people. We will be with thee in the war. But eventually, Jehoshaphat said, can we find any man of God, a prophet? that can tell us and show us how to go. And uh, he had brought all the prophets of Baal, and they prophesied, prophesied, prophesied. Anybody can prophesy. That's how they've been doing. They're false prophets, and their prophecies are false. I pray the false prophecy will not mislead you in Jesus' name. Amen. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there no other person, no other man of God that can show us the way? Oh, he have said, There's just one. It's there. But I hate him because he doesn't minimize the message. He doesn't kind of moderate the message. He gives it to you like it is. He doesn't use wisdom. He just gets it to you and it's like a dagger in your heart. I hate him. I don't want to listen to him. Jehoshaphat said, don't talk like that. Let's bring him here. And then they brought the man. I pray you'll be like that man. I said, I pray you'll be like that man. And then he put the hammer on the nail and said, you go, you'll not come back. He said, here, everybody, put him in the prison until I come back. And the man of God said, if you came back, 
no, the Lord has not spoken to me. And eventually they were going now. But he knew, he knew that that man of God never misses it. They will know you. You will never miss it. When you talk, heaven will confirm it in Jesus' name. And so he said, Jehoshaphat, you know what you are going to do in this battle? I will go, I will disguise myself, but you keep your royal robe on. Be like the king. But I will disguise myself. He wanted to get the man into trouble. There is loss, the loss of life. You can lose your life. You can lose your ministry. You can lose everything you have gathered all these many years with that compromise, with partnership, with the ungodly. Look at verse 28. So, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself. And I will go to the battle, but put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went to the battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save only, except only the king of Israel. And it came to pass, look at this, when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, it is the king of Israel. That's what uh, Ahab wanted to do. He wanted to uh, put uh, this uh, king of uh, Judah into trouble. That's why I said, I'll discuss myself. I will be humble and I will go like ordinary person. But you go like the real king. Therefore, they compassed him about uh, to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. They will not catch you. God forgive you. I said, God forgive you. Spare your life so that you'll settle with God and then as you settle with the Lord you'll never do that in your life again I was waiting for your amen look at it now verse 32 for it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel they turned back again from pursuing him and a certain man drew a bow at a venture accidentally and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the anus. Therefore he said to the chariot to the chariot man, Turn thy hand that thou mayest carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. The prophet said so. The word of God will not fall to the ground. And the battle increased that day. How be it, the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the evening. And about the time of the sun going down, what happened? He died. The man of God said so. He should have taken to the word of God. Because the word of God warned him that if you go in this world, you will not come back alive. He just said, here, what the man is saying, here, ye, O people, but he still died. But let's look at our man now, Jehoshaphat, on equal yoke. On equal yoke. That's a consequence. That's a cost. And it is irretrievable. Look at chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Anani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king, Jehoshaphat, shouldest thou help the ungodly? Shouldest thou support the ungodly? Shouldest thou encourage the ungodly? And shouldest thou be in partnership with the ungodly? Somebody that is rebellious against the word of God and love them that hate the Lord 
would you say you are ignorant of the life of Ahab? Don't you know he hated the Lord to the core? And don't you know he was rebellious against the word of God? And should you love people like that, support people like that, back up people like that, and lift up people like that, and encourage people like that, and go with them to the battlefield? Therefore, is the wrath upon thee from before the Lord. There is a judgment if somebody persists in unequal yoke. We're coming to Second Samuel chapter 15. Second Samuel chapter 15. I'm reading here from verse 12. Second Samuel chapter 15. We're reading from verse 12. Unequal yoke. Uh, we need to be very watchful because there are people that have limited understanding of what the unequal yoke is. And they think, okay, thank God I'm married to a believer. That's not the end. Thank God I'm working in an office. I'm not, you know, doing business with any uh, body who is not following after the Lord. That's not the end of the unequal yoke. In Second Samuel chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 12. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Kilonite, David's counselor, from a city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. Absalom was ungodly. Absalom was sinful. Absalom was wicked. Absalom was evil. He had the mind to overthrow his father. And then he had the mind to rule by force. And he didn't have any calling of God to do that. And then he sent for Ahithophel. And Ahithophel came to him. That's an equal yoke. Somebody has a plan to do something that is not right. He has a plan to overthrow uh, the ministry, the work of God, the church of God. That's not right. And then he sends for you. He's asking for your cooperation. He's asking for your understanding. Whatever story he might tell you, if you cooperate with him, if you agree with him, that's an equal yoke. Let's look at it now in uh, chapter 16, uh, verse 23. 16 verse 23 and the counsel of Ahithophel which he counseled in those days was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God so was all the counsel of Ahithophel both with David and with Absalom so Ahithophel was joined to Absalom with an unequal yoke you send your money to somebody who is preaching false doctrine. That's an equal yoke. You give your support to somebody who is perpetrating false doctrine. That's an equal yoke. And you lend your voice to somebody that has gone out of the way. And we know that he's doing evil. He's not taking people to heaven. He wants to scatter the church of God. And he wants to deny people from hearing sound doctrine. And then you are supporting them. And you are smiling at them. And you are praying with them. And you are praying for them. And you are giving your materials things to them that's an equal yoke let's look at now the irretrievable laws of partnership with the ungodly chapter 17 i'm reading from verse 23 chapter 17 verse 23 and when his fellow saw that his counsel was not followed he saddled his ass and he arose and got him home to his house to his city and put his household in order and he what did he do i said what did he do he hanged himself and died did he go to heaven he died in rebellion he died inside that unequal yoke and then it says he was buried in the sepulcher of his father we're coming to psalm 50 psalm 50 we need to understand what the unequal yoke is. And we need to understand the extent, the depth of the unequal yoke, the height of the unequal, the length and the breadth of the unequal yoke. It's not just that I didn't marry an unbeliever, it's more than that. In Psalm 50, we're looking at verses 18 
all through to 22. Psalm 50, we're looking at verse 18. When thou sowest a seed, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou seetest and speakest against thy brother, and thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and search them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I cheer you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. It's telling us here, on equal yoke, when somebody is doing a kind of business that is just a thief, it's a thief, and you are the one helping them, supporting them. They don't know how to register. You are the one that show them how to register. And they do not know how to get other people and how to get um, people that will join them. He wants to cheat people. He wants to be fraudulent. And he's saying that, you know, I need, uh, you know, a hundred people. If I have a hundred people and then they contribute this and this, this will be your commission. And you yourself, you are looking for money, you have forgotten your Bible. And you see, see, it's going to take their money, it's going to run away, and you are the one looking for members of the church, you are the one looking for supporters that will contribute to that kind of fraudulent business that's on equal you. Because the Lord says you have been partner and partaker with adulterers, and you consent and you support those who are thieves, he said. I will tear you to pieces and there'll be none to rescue. We're coming to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 1. Jonah chapter 1. The unequal yoke. As we come to Jonah chapter 1, you know the story of Jonah. I'll just remind you of the events that happened in the life of Jonah. And then we will see the people that helped him. We'll see the irretrievable loss of partnership with the ungodly. It says in uh, chapter 1 of Jonah, Now the watch of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a sheep going to Tarshish so he paid the fear thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish and then he says from the presence of the Lord those people they appeared innocent they appeared ignorant. What can we do? We're running a trade and we're running transportation and we happen to have a boat, a ship, and somebody comes, he has paid his deal, he has paid his fare, and we know where we're going. It's more than that. It's more than that. The man is running away from the presence of God. He's running away from the call. The Lord has given him and now you are supporting him. And now you are sustaining that disobedience and rebellion. And you accept him. Look at the word of God, verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea. So that the sheep was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid. And they cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the sheep into the sea. They never recovered that again. That's the irretrievable loss. They lost their property. They lost everything in the sheep. They said to lighten each of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the sheep, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, 
What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. The unequal yoke continued. They accommodated Jonah. They gave Jonah a right to run away from the presence of God. Meanwhile, the neighbors were waiting. They were waiting for the message that God had sent to them through Jonah. But Jonah said, no, I will not go. I'm going to rebel. I'm going to disobey. And these people were in agreement with him, carrying him where he wanted to go. Verse 7, and they said, everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause is this evil upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? You should have checked up before uh, you brought him into the ship. You brought a stranger into your house, so you didn't know where they're coming from. You don't know that they're fighting against God. And you don't know that there's something in a evil following after them because they're disobeying the Lord. Now you are asking the questions. Well, he told them, and he said unto them, I am an Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said unto him, What shall we do unto thee? That the sea may become unto us, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea become unto you. For I know that it is for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode uh, hard to bring it to land. They wanted to keep that on equal yoke. No, we can't, we can't uh, throw you overboard. We're going to stay with you. We sympathize with you. We don't fully agree with what you've done. We're so afraid that you did that. But all the same, all the same, how can we throw you overboard? But they saw that they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And tell me there, the sea ceased from her reaching. That was the problem. It's the problem of the unequal yoke. I pray that you'll not be unequally yoked together with a backslider, with a runaway prodigal prophet, with a runaway prodigal preacher. You will not support them in Jesus' name. If you are not going to support them, say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 5. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, For this ye know, that no monger, no unclean person, no covetous man, who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Verse 7, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Break that yoke, that unequal yoke. Break that link, that unequal link. 
break the thing that associates you and ties you with those unbelieving people and the Lord will have mercy on you in Jesus name I said the Lord will have mercy on me in Jesus name point number two now the irreproachable landmarks of perception by the uncompromising is very serious now you see, we need to understand the limit of unequal yoke, the meaning of unequal yoke. And we need to understand that many things that other people might say, that's unequal yoke, that's unequal yoke, may not be unequal yoke at all. And the scriptures need to enlighten us and show us the way of the things that are not unequal yoke. That's why we're calling this landmarks of perception the landmarks of perception and this is irreproachable the irreproachable landmarks of perception by the uncompromising i'm coming to daniel chapter one you know daniel very well daniel chapter one and i'm reading here from verse eight daniel chapter one and we're reading here from verse eight it says in daniel chapter one verse eight but daniel Purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Understand? Daniel was in captivity, Daniel was in Babylon. Understand? The king Nebuchadnezzar had chosen some people to learn the science and the studies of the Chaldeans. Not only that, to learn the language of the Chaldeans so that among them, they will choose people that will work. They will work while they are there. They will work in the palace of the king. That's not an equal yoke. You are in a place of work, and that place of work is not a Christian organization. It's not a Christian company. And you are there to move the business there forward. It's a good business. It's a normal business. And you're employed there. You are not compromising, although you are helping an organization which is not necessarily a Christian organization. I want you to look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 47. Daniel chapter 2, verse 47, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. And the king made Daniel a great man. That's not an unequal yoke. It's not a political office. It's that he's gone through his college. He's gone through studies. And now there was nobody to do what Daniel was able to do there. And the king made him a great man and gave him many gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Babylon was not a Christian community, a religious community. It was just a community of the Babylonians. And then it says, and the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon, all the other employees there, he made Daniel to be over them. Look at verse 49. Then Daniel requested the king and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Even though Babylon was uh, ungodly, Babylon was unrighteous, and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there, they did what was available to be done. That is not unequal. We're coming to Genesis. And I'm reading from chapter 41, Genesis chapter 41, the irreproachable landmarks of perception. We need to understand the scriptures and we need to understand what an equal yoke is and what an equal yoke is not. In Genesis chapter 41, I'm reading from verse 37. From verse 37, and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. And in the eyes of all his servants, and Pharaoh said 
unto his servants. Can we find such a one as this is a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and so wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. You see that? This is not an equal yoke. Here is the king of Egypt calling uh, Joseph, and he said, because the Lord has revealed this dream and this interpretation through you, there's nobody as wise as you are, as discreet as you are, as intelligent as you are, a person that can manage the affairs of the Egyptian hierarchy like you. Because of that, you'll be over my house and over my people, and you will rule over everything. Look at verse 41, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. It says, um, I am still going to be there as the overall leader, as the overall emperor, but now you will be ruling under me. That's not an equal yoke. It was the fulfillment of the dream that the Lord had given to Joseph. We're coming to Psalm 105, Psalm 105. And I'm reading from verse 18. Psalm 105, verse 18. Still talking about Joseph, whose feet the hurt were fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that the word came. The word of the Lord tried him. And the king, this Pharaoh now, said, and loosed him, even the ruler of the people and let him go free and he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance look at verse 22 to bind the princes at his pleasure and tell me that verse 22 the last line there say it aloud okay i'm waiting for you one two three go and teach his senators wisdom. That's not an equal yoke. It wasn't like a political uh, person. He didn't campaign for this. And then all these senators in the land of Egypt, they were there. And Pharaoh said, show them the way of wisdom. Teach them the way of wisdom. And then somebody might say, uh, Joseph was getting to an equal yoke, not at all. That wasn't an equal yoke. The Lord grants you understanding. For Samuel chapter 30. For Samuel chapter 30. And I'm reading here from verse, uh, reading from verse uh, 8. For Samuel chapter 30. Reading from verse 8. The situation here is uh, was when uh, David lost his wives and lost uh, all that he had, and the people had come, and they're taking everything away. In fact, all the soldiers with him, because of the loss, they cried, and even David cried without anybody to encourage him. But then he encouraged himself in the Lord, and he asked the question, shall we pursue? In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. Somebody there tonight, recover all. In your family, recover all. In the ministry, recover all. And so now they were going to pursue and they were going to recover. They were going to recover. How will they do this? They didn't know where the people who had come to take their property away, they didn't know where they were. The Lord just said, pursue. Look at verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field and they brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat. And they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs, 
and there are two clusters of reasons. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. For he had eaten no bread, nor drunk any water, three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, and servant to an Amalekite. And my master let me, because three days are gone, I fell sick. And we made an invasion upon the south of the Kerithites, and upon the coast which belonged to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziglak with fire. Hold on now. Here is an Egyptian, and here is the son of an Amalekite. Double way he was unbeliever. Egypt, Amalek. Egyptian, Amalekite. And now, what was David to do? Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We're pursuing. And we want to go and catch those people. And the only one that knows the way, and the only one that knows how to get them, is an Amalekite, is an Egyptian. What are we going to do? This is not unequal yoke. Look at this. We're building this uh, gigantic auditorium. And there were things we didn't know how to do by ourselves. We we're thinking of all the various areas. And then we call experts. Those experts, they are not necessarily saved, sanctified, spirit-filled Christians. This is job. This is work. And we're not unequally yoked together with them. We are telling them to come and show their expertise and their experience and they have done all this and they have gone back home and the building still remains to be used for the glory of God. Did I hear an amen? amen. That's not an equal yoke. You see, you can make use of the services of the people that have the intelligence, they have the understanding, they have the training, even though they are not believers. They make these available. Look at verse 15. David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me to the hands of my master. And I will bring thee down to this company. And then the story goes on. And he brought them down. And in verse 18, And David recovered all. And David recovered all. And deeper life recovers all. And your local church recovers all. And you, are you there? Or are you? Let me see you before I talk to you. And you will recover all. That is not an equal yoke. Well, coming to First Kings chapter 5. First Kings chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 1. First Kings chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 1. It tells us here in First Kings chapter 5 verse 1. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sage, his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. And Solomon said to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how that David, my father, could not build a house unto the Lord his God, for the wars which were about him on every side until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side so that there is neither adversary nor evil or courage. And behold, I purpose to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, 
whom I will set upon thy throne. In thy room shall build an house unto my name. Now therefore command thou that the heal me cedar tree out of Lebanon. My servants shall be with thy servants. You see that? My servants will be with thy servants. This is not an equal yoke. Because God did not condemn this. He needed wood, good wood, and strong wood, and can only come from Lebanon. And the servants of Hiram, they knew how to cut them down and how to ship them down. And so uh, Solomon went to him, and he got this help. And the servants were together. And unto thee will I give hire for thy servants, according to all that shall appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to heal timber like the Sidonians. Remember Tar and Sidon? Tar and Sidon, they were unbelievers, and actually, eventually, they perish. But now Solomon said, There's nobody among us here, there's nobody in all my kingdom that can cut the wood like your servants can. Therefore, send them to me. Verse 7. And it came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day which has given unto David a wise son over this great people. And Hiram said to Solomon, Seeing I have considered the things which thou sentest to me for, and I will do all thy desire concerning the timber and the obsidian. And then he goes on to say, and concerning the timber of fear, my servant shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea, and I will convey them by sea in floats unto the place that thou shalt appoint me, and will cause them to be discharged there. And thou shalt receive them, and thou shalt accomplish my desire in giving food for my household. So Hiram gave us Solomon cedar trees and fair trees according to all his desire. That's not an equal yoke, employing the people that needed to give them the necessary material to build the house of God. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 33. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 33. In verse 33, it says, And when they heard that, they were caught to the heart and took counsel to slay them. The apostles were before the council of the Jews. And these leaders of Jews, they said, we told you not to speak in this name. And now you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And then the boldness of the Spirit came upon Peter like it will come upon you. He said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And then he began to tell them again about Jesus crucified. Jesus who died and Jesus who rose again. God has raised him from the dead and we are witnesses and it says when they had that they were caught to the heart and he took counsel to kill them to slay them then stood up there one in the council a Pharisee not a Christian not a believer not born again named Gamaliel a doctor of the law and had a reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And he said unto them, ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. And then he went on, look at uh, verse 38. And now I say unto you, an unbeliever, and now I say unto you, this Gamaliel, 
and now I say unto you, it's not a fellow brother, a fellow believer, and this is not a gospeler. It says, I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught, it will die a natural death. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. And to him they agreed. They wanted to kill them. That's why they didn't kill them anymore. And to him they agreed. You see, it was of hell to preserve those apostles. That's how we have the New Testament now. That's how we have the epistles now. That's why we have the church now because God used that man Gamaliel to preserve the lives of these apostles. You know, some people say, no, I don't want any unbeliever to put mouth in this. If I'm going to go to prison, let me go. If I'm going to die, let me die because that will be an equal yoke. If there's no believer that will come and get me out of this, if there is no believer, a real, safe, sanctified child of God that will get me out of this trouble, unbeliever, ah, hold your help. Keep your help. I will die. Well, you'll go to heaven. But the work that ought to be done will not be done. No, you will not die. Or are you there? You will not die. Yes. You're going to be wise and whoever God sends ahead, sends along to help and keep you, it will keep you in Jesus' name. I'm coming to chapter 28, chapter 28 of Acts. Acts chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 1. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people, the barbarous people, barbarians, and the barbarous people, uh, the uneducated, unenlightened people, unchristian people, and the barbarous people, the heathen, the pagans, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. That means they showed us much kindness. For they kindled a fire and received us, everyone, because of the present rain and because of the cold. Paul the Apostle was there, and some disciples were there. And he says, these barbarous people, they made fire because it was cold. And somebody said, no, I'm not going to warm myself for the fire that an unbeliever has made. That is an equal yoke. No, that's not an equal yoke. Understand this, you enjoy Nepa in your house, all the people providing the Nepa electricity, they're not all saved, sanctified, spirit filled, and then you use the Nepa. And the same way, Paul the Apostle here understood that is not unequal yoke. We must have a good understanding of what unequal yoke is and what unequal yoke is not. And when Paul in verse 3 had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his sun. And when the barbarians, the pagans, when those people, when they saw the venomous beast hang on his sand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. They were pagans, so they had superstition. And you shook off the beast, you shake it off. Yeah. Into the fire and felt no arm. How be it they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they looked a great while and saw no harm, that's how they look at you and they'll say no harm. They come to him, they changed their mind, and they said he was a god. In the same quarter, there were possessions of the chief man of the island, barbarians, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. Unbelievers, they gave them accommodation. They lodged us and accepted the accommodation. That's not an equal yoke in verse 8. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever. 
and of the bloody flocks, and to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid hands on him and healed him. God will use you like that. So, when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and they were healed. Look at verse 10. Who also honored us, apostles, brothers, sisters, children of God, these pagans, these barbarians, they honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laid it us with such things as were necessary. That's not an equal you. Those people, they are the creatures of God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And these apostles and these people of God, they were going. They were going to the place, going to Rome. And Paul was going to witness there in Rome. And over there in the island, they had nobody, no believer, no church, nobody at all. And so the help came to them and they received the help. When God sends help to you through his own creatures, you will receive, you will be blessed in Jesus' name. I'm coming to point number three now. The irreversible largeness of promise from the unchangeable. The unchangeable, that's God himself. God himself. Is the unchanging God, the unchangeable, and is giving us promises that are large. And those large promises, they are irreversible. The irreversible largeness of promise from the unchangeable. We're coming to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 6. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore the sons of Jacob are not consumed. God has not changed. God has not changed. And his promises have not changed. If you understand the precept, that's a commandment. Be not unequal yoke together with unbelievers. You must also understand the promise that says that he can use the wind, he can use the sea, he can use the whale, he can use the bird, he can use the raven, he can use anything to fulfill his will. If we accept his precept, we must also understand his promise, the irreversible largeness of promise from the unchangeable. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. I say chapter 14, the largeness of his promise, and he has not changed. The greatness of his promise, and he has not changed. I say chapter 14, reading from verse 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them. And the strangers shall be joined with them. That is, the Lord is going to use the Israelites and they're going to bring Gentiles. They're going to bring strangers and they'll be joined unto them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob and the people shall take them. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and for handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were. You need to understand that one. They, the children of Israel, will take the heathen captives, whose captives they were. And they shall rule over their oppressors. 
You see, the Lord was going to turn everything around. That all those some believers, they will come and they will serve the people of God. Look at that Isaiah chapter 14. And I'm reading from verse 24. And the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, surely, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. As I have purposed, so it shall stand. Verse 27, for the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? I'm coming to chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. I see chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. I want you to understand this. Cyrus eventually uh, was born about 170 years to 180 years after the prophecy. But God said, the Cyrus, an unbeliever, unbeliever, unbelieving king, whose right hand I have called him to subdue nations before him, I will lose the loins of kings and to open before him the two lived gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight, and I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness. You mean something there. Yeah. And the hidden riches of secret places. Yeah. That thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which called thee by thy name, I am the God of Israel. Look at verse 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and for Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by name. That's Cyrus. I have so named thee, though thou hast not known me. Though thou hast not known me, you are a creature in my hand. And I'm going to use you to release the children of Israel. Verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I guarded thee, though thou hast not known me. I gathered thee, though thou hast not known me. Verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself. The word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return. That unto me Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. He wants us to reach all the creatures. And if we say, uh uh, that was an unbeliever, how are we going to get them? We we'll bring them on. We're not asking for anything. All we're asking for is that God will use you, God will use us to bring them to the knowledge of the gospel. They will come. I said, they will come. Look at Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. And I'm reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 4. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught. And in vain yet, and in vain yet, surely my judgment is with the Lord. And my work with my God. And now says the Lord that for me, from the womb to be a servant to bring Jacob again to him though Israel be not gathered yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord my God shall be my strength and he said it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation to the end of the earth. 
Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and the Holy One, to him who man despises, to him whom the nations abhorrent, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see thee and arise. Princes also shall worship thee because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, he shall choose thee. He shall choose thee. Isaiah 61, verses 5 and 6. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 5 and 6. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. The sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. And ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. Now, chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60. I'm reading here from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Arise and shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. And the glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light. Don't drive them away. Don't drive them away. The Gentiles shall come to thy light. And kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together. They come to thee. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. And the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. You see, these are the promises of God. And you will say, well, the Gentiles, the Gentiles, they are, you know, I have nothing to deal with them. Look at the promise the Lord is giving. It says in verse 6, the multitude of camels shall cover thee. And the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they sh from Sheba shall come. And they shall bring gold and incense. And they shall show forth praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedah shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaoth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are these that fly in the aeroplane? Who are these that fly over the sky? Who are these that fly as a cloud and as doves? To their windows, surely the isles shall wait for me, and the sheaves of Tashish forced to bring thy sons from afar. They are bringing them. I said they are bringing them. Community leaders will bring them. Counselors will bring them. Governors will bring them. The people who are ruling over there will say, let's go, let's go. We're going to the house of God. They'll bring them from afar in Jesus' name. And when they bring them, they remain your sons. They remain your converts. It says their silver and their gold with them. Unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified thee. Thy, the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. 
I'm going to read that again. I, I want you to hear. And the sons of strangers shall build thy walls. And their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore, thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought for the nation and the kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee. The fair tree, the pine tree, the box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. And all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas, whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency. A joy of many generations. Thou shalt suck the milk of the Gentiles. And shall suck the breast of the kings. They shall know that I the Lord am thy savior. And thy redeemer. The mighty one of Jacob. For brass I will bring gold. For iron I will bring silver. And for wood brass. And for stones iron. I will also make thy officers peace, and thine exactors righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting or destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. The sun, the sun shall no more be thy light by day. Neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light. And thy God, thy glory, thy son shall no more go down. Neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light. And the days of mourning shall be ended. The people also shall all be righteous. And they shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting. The work of my hands. That I may be glorified. A little one. Where is he there? Rise up now. Rise up now. Rise up now. This is yours. This is for you personally. This is for your family. This is for your local church. This for the city church. This is for the church in the region. This is for the church in the state. And this is for the church in the nation. A little one shall become a thousand. A small one, a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. It's not an equal yoke. All the riches and all the things of the Gentiles, they're coming, they're going to be converted. And as they are converted, all the resources of the land will be available to reach out so that we're going to touch every community, every street, and every, every village, and every town. We're going to touch the whole nation. Rise up. It's a great thing the Lord has promised. I, don't be unequally yoked together with some believers, but don't remember, don't forget the landmark of perception. Don't forget the promises that are so large the Lord has given to us. And then open wide your mouth, open wide your heart. Great things are about to happen. Open your mouth and pray.